Hey everybody, Hoosier Jedi here with another review for you. This time I'm talking the movie Mad Max Fury Road. Uh, now, when this movie initially came out, I was pretty skeptical towards it. It just seemed like another example of Hollywood doing a reboot slash cash grab of an old successful franchise. And uh, given the track record with those things, yeah. But when the movie actually came out... Um, uh, all I really seemed to hear for the most part about it was good stuff. A lot of all of my friends uh, who talked about the movie on Facebook and stuff really, really seemed to enjoy it. And I thought, well, okay, I guess um, when the movie comes out on DVD, I'll pick it up uh, sometime and uh, just watch it. So um, that's eventually what I did the other day. I uh, really got it from the library, watched it, and it. Um, I had quite a bit. Of, I had quite a bit of fun with it. It was. A, pretty enjoyable movie and uh, you know I understood why my friends uh, enjoyed it so much now uh, that said it's not to say that there aren't some things about the movie that I didn't like uh, that, that I definitely think there are some genuine criticisms that you can level at the movie but for the most part it's it's a pretty pretty fun and enjoyable film uh, so we're gonna do this uh, in the usual fashion where I'm just gonna talk about the movie in general for a while and then at the end um, kind of give everybody who anybody who want to avoid spoilers, um, chance to step away, and then we'll talk about some things uh, plot-wise in detail. So, <clears throat> uh, as a whole, and this, the cool thing is they, like, they, they got the guy who originally made the original Mad Max movies back to do this movie, which of course is really cool. And there's a lot of that you see in the first few minutes of the movie with um, the Citadel where you have like the main character, where most of the characters come from. You kind of get the sense of you know the wives and the milkers and uh, you know this uh, the world that they live in. It, it, I mean, it's shown to you very quickly. You kind of pick up a little bit of what this place is like and what the culture of of this place is like very very quickly. It's a great example of show don't tell. <clears throat> now, um, as for the Mad Max himself, well, this does kind of follow the the Mad Max formula pretty pretty straightforward. Now again, I have seen all of the Mad Max movies, but I haven't seen any of them since I was a teenager, uh, and that was unfortunately quite a while back. So I don't remember a huge amount of the details of them. But the basic idea is that Max is somebody who just takes a very look. I don't want to be involved in this stuff. Non, I don't want to be involved in this kind of thing. And then eventually he comes around and starts helping the people who are in trouble. And it all sort of more or less works out at the end. And, and this movie is really no different than that. Uh, the only real major thing here is that um, basically we have Furiosa in the movie, and it's pretty clear that she's really sort of intended to be basically be female Mad Max in a lot of ways. And that's kind of one of the things that... Well, when this movie came out, <laughs> and this is something that I find more than a little amusing, uh, some some guy wrote this big rant about Furiosa and all this other stuff, and basically said that he was going to try and you know campaign to get people to not see this movie. And it wasn't so much that that went viral so much it was as the backlash against this guy. When really, there was no real gigantic organized movement of of people against this movie. It was just some stupid post by one random guy. But the internet being the internet, something goes viral, the the distort the reality of things tends to get distorted. And then people saw all those people who were saying, like, you know, screw this guy, and somehow thought that there's some some major social victory had happened. When of course it didn't. It was just some stupid guy on the internet got told. One dude. One dude. And um, this led to uh, what I've seen people on the internet calling the Furiosa test. And this is basically an idea of if a movie has females as a lead characters, and apparently there's a bunch of guys online who get up in arms about it, then this is somehow some sort of positive thing for women. I don't know. Uh, apparently, the new Ghostbusters movie passed that with flying colors, which, it, in all fairness, the, the the way people got really worked up about the new Ghostbusters movie was 
pretty, pretty ridiculous. I mean, it's just like, really, Internet? Are you kidding me? Now, beyond that, I don't really have any comment about that movie because I haven't seen it. So we're just going to leave that there. Uh, but in any case, uh, I did end up liking Furiosa as a character, although it did sort of take me a while to warm up to her. It wasn't really until about, I'd say probably past the middle point of the movie where we get some idea of her backstory and um, she really receives a pretty serious uh, kick in the face from the plot where she really sort of cr crystallizes as a character for me. And, uh, you know, I really started to, you know, kind of get on board with her. And, you know, this is, um, this is a character being played by Charlize Theron, who's somebody I've liked for, for quite a while. Um, I think the first movie I ever saw with her was probably John Carpenter's Vampires, which wasn't that great of a flick, but she was, she was pretty fun in that movie. Uh, anywho. Um, and of course, uh, you know we have um, uh, five uh, some, the, the women that she's trying to help, and, and I don't really consider this a spoiler because if you're if you're even really paying attention to anything about this movie, you know at least this much. Um, are also kind of very integral to the plot. And one of my criticisms here of this movie is that two of these women, the wives, um, are only ever called by their names, like in the movie like the others they all have names but they're never even mentioned apparently you either have to read about the movie itself like i did you know, just sort of doing a little um, research on it or you have to pay attention to the closing credits because otherwise these women's names are never even so much as mentioned and if you're going to be going for something that's um apparently such a female empowerment thing i think sort of giving the female <laughs> characters uh, names that are mentioned in the movie might be a good idea. Um, another criticism I have of this, and let's just kind of get this whole the whole feminist aspect out of, out of the way real quick, is that um, it, it's really sort of the movie is sort of kind of raising the idea that that men are the ones responsible for destroying the world. You know, all the female characters in the movie are good, and this this is something that I, ideas like this like you know if women were in charge of things you know there wouldn't be war or poverty or thing like well no I don't believe that for a minute and if you just sort of look at uh, at history like um, for example like Imelda Marcos who was the wife of the former president of the Philippines was renowned for lavishly spending money on uh, like millions and millions of dollars on shoes and then in more modern days you have uh, women like uh, over in France like uh, Marie Trudeau I think is her name she's a major player in the sort of right wing anti immigrant factions in France uh South Korea has Gung Hee Park as president she's the daughter of the military dictator from like the 1970s who um after stepping into power pretty swiftly passed some uh extremely questionable legislation in regards to um, free speech. So uh, this, to me, the idea that uh, you know, if you have women in charge of things, that uh, you know, the bad stuff is all going to go away, just really does seem absurd. Um. So let's see, what else do we have to say about this? Um. One also does sort of have to note that the women that are all nice and attractive looking are all the, the heroines while the less than attractive women are kind of left behind with the bad guy i mean granted there's probably there's some some plot reason I, I i can sort of vaguely imagine that um it basically they're not going to fit in this hiding space was probably part of it but still still it uh it, it doesn't really send uh I think the greatest message. Never mind. You also have another female character who pops up in the movie, and the first time we're introduced to her, she's naked. Yeah. And the the way it's all framed is like you can never you never actually really see anything, but. Um. Well, with that said, though, um, I, I think we're just going to kind of leave that at that for the moment. 
so let's see what else do we have to talk about um didn't really think too much of uh immortan joe who is the main villain of this movie um he he just kind of comes off as very poorly defined and he really only has like the most vague of motivations um i mean okay i guess it's not vague i mean it's very clear exactly what he wants but it just sort of feels like really you're expending all of your resources on this one thing really is this the best strategy and um ultimately no no it isn't <laughs> Uh, but, you know, it would have been nice if we could have gotten some details as to who this guy was and, you know, a little bit more about exactly what his deal was. And the thing is, though, when you do some reading about the movie, there was some stuff in the background material that sort of spelled out a little bit more of who he was and where he came from. And in my mind, that kind of makes it would have made him a lot more interesting character if we could have gotten some of that. Here, he just sort of seems like some sort of Mad Max, low-rent version of Darth Vader. And he never even really does anything in the movie that makes him seem terribly threatening. I mean, the, he basically spends the majority of the movie driving a car and yelling at people. That's it. And then what else? Well... I do have to give the movie uh, more than a little credit that in terms of just like action and spectacle, I mean, it's fantastic. And that's really um, what really, I think, sells this movie for a lot of people. And, and on that front, it's really great. And yes, uh, Koma, the doof warrior, uh, the guy who's like playing the guitar with the flames shooting out of it. Uh, he is immensely awesome. And even though he never really does much besides that in the entire movie, it's really hard not to like. Wow, that character's great. I mean, he 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 is a lot of fun. Um. So let's see what else. Um. One thing I did notice is that you know Martin's Joe's two sons that he has already. Uh, one is this like gigantic guy who's clearly not all right in the head, and the other is this uh deformed dwarf dude. Um. Seems like uh, they're pretty clearly cribbing from Master Blaster from one of the previous movies, which seems a little bit repetitive. And another thing I liked about this movie is that um, the whole Mad Max thing, like the idea of Max genuinely being crazy is played up a little bit more. And we do see him have these hallucinations, which sort of imply that possibly some really bad stuff might have happened to some of the characters we met in the previous movies. Um... But again, the whole continuity with the Mad Max movies, and even the creator said this, is that it's not really meant to be a tight continuity. It's more like legends about this one particular guy. So, of course, a lot of the stuff and the details aren't going to match up because the guy that created Mad Max just doesn't care. He's just more interested in telling a cool story. And okay, fair enough, I can respect that. Um... But yeah, once you kind of get back past, you know, the action and the spectacle of it all, I mean, there are some nice character moments, but you don't really go to a Mad Max movie for character stuff. And at the end of the day, the movie is, I mean, it's a very satisfying movie to watch. It's very fun. But if you're someone like me, you're kind of hoping for a little bit more in terms of story in general when you go to a movie than it definitely does leave you a little bit wanting. So, um, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's call it a general review here, and I'm going to give you a typical five for moving on to spoilers. Okay, so one thing uh, that kind of bothers me about this movie is the whole relationship between Nux and the red-haired wife, whose name is apparently Capable. You, you can't criticize a Mad Max movie for characters having stupid names. That's just part of the deal. Also, the I guess since this movie's set in Australia or something, the lady, the, the wife who's supposed to be kind of not white, um, her name is Toast. Like, seriously. But anyway, uh, Capable and Nux sort of do seem to be Find, found this sort of burgeoning relationship very quickly after he joins the group. 
And even though just shortly before it, he'd been chasing them down to drag them back to, you know, sexual slavery, nobody seems to have any sort of objection to this. Now, granted, they did give, you know, Nux that really nice moment where he's just sort of having this breakdown and realizing it's like, man, I, I have screwed my life so badly, I'm not going to get into Valhalla. And it's, I mean, it's a nicely acted scene and all, and you do feel a little bit sorry for him, even though he is one of the bad guys. In a lot of ways, he's also just a, as much a victim as everybody else. You know, he's been spent his whole life being taught this nonsense religion and getting getting high on chemicals, and uh, you know, he's suffering from like lymphoma or something. But still, the idea that they're just so quick to trust him seems a little a little questionable. Max. Okay, I mean, Max kind of does stuff to both sort of in his favor and against his favor in regards to the women. But I think he does by the time they kind of meet up with the old ladies out in the desert, that he's done more, more to sort of properly earn their trust. And, you know, that's another thing about them. Like uh, the Volvatani, I think they're properly called. Well, again, not very subtle, as their name sounds suspiciously like the word Volva. Uh, again, we're introduced to the character whose name is Valkyrie. Um, I don't think her name is again ever mentioned. And like I said earlier, we first meet her, she's naked, which, yeah. And it's kind of weird. It's like, okay, so we've got these old ladies and the one hot, young, pretty one. Okay. Well, uh, I guess we know why, you know, Valkyrie was the ch one that was chosen to go out there and be naked, but still. And. I'm just trying to think of the right words here. I mean, the old ladies seemed, I mean, seemed kind of cool and all that, but it just sort of does raise the question of, like, well, wait a minute. Like, how is it that Mad Max sort of was a cop at some point, but it sounds, from what we've heard, like the world fell apart when these old ladies were younger? Uh, I mean, reasonably young people? I don't know. I mean, again, don't worry, look for too much continuity on this with Mad Max. Um, it's just sort of like, well, these guys are out in the middle of the desert. Like, how are they surviving? Especially, I mean, they're obviously tough old ladies, but they're still old ladies. And, you know, again, it does sort of play a lot here, particularly in there with the whole, it was men who killed the world, which, uh, again, I, I just really don't buy into that at all. Um, let's see. What else? What else? Oh, um, yeah, as I was saying, the whole thing with uh, the, the ladies who are not young and hot, I think they're called milkers or something like that. You, you have to notice that Furiosi only saves the ones that are young and hot. Now, granted, she hides them in this little container in the, in the truck, so the ladies who are not young and hot are big ladies and probably would not have fit in there easily. So I guess you could sort of use that as a justification for why Furiosa didn't try to save them. And we do get a shot at the end that shows that, yes, those women have indeed been liberated, which, okay, good. But still, I mean, for all this, you know, girl power, whatnot, that's going on in this movie, it's still, you know, we're still, the main focus is on saving the young, the young, hot, pretty ladies. And again, we are introduced to some, one of the main, a female character who's supposed to be seriously badass, and she she does earn her stripes in all fairness to that one, while she's naked and being used as bait, which again does seem to be somewhat contradictory to it all. Um, let's see what else. You know, I, I mean, I think that kind of covers everything that I had to say at this at the for this movie. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, it's a fun movie, and it's a very enjoyable movie, and it is certainly nice to put forward a character like Furiosa. I mean, she did take a little while for me to get on board with her, but at the end of the day, I was pretty happy with her. And I can certainly see why a lot of female viewers would have embraced this film. That said, I don't think, if you really stop and think about it, that it's quite this sort of win for female protagonists in film as much as some people are making it out to be. I mean, it's definitely, 
in a lot of ways a step in the right direction, but there are also some some valid criticisms in that regard that I think you can level with this film. And it's also just another reminder that we really should stop getting so damn worked up over movies on the internet. But with that said, I'm going to call it here, guys. Uh, as always, please comment, rate, and subscribe. Of course, you can follow me on Twitter at Hoosier Jedi and on Tumblr at Jedi Reviewer. Until next time, take care and have a good one.